Well, um, welcome to all of you. And uh, I really appreciate you coming to hear my presentation today. And it's a great honor to be here and to talk to you about this subject of uh, interest of mine. Um, and my goal today is to talk to you about an exciting new academic field called educational so neuroscience that Vanderbilt is actually really leading the way in. Um, this field is pushing the boundaries of science and is allowing for examination of how we can better educate our nation's children. So what is educational neuroscience? The fundamentals. So clearly it, in, it combines neuroscience and education. So neuroscience methods and um, educational research methods, both of, bo both of which have rather sophisticated ways of examining children's development and brain development. And so it's taking those two together. So it takes research on brain development and it applies it to better understand how to educate children. And then we take educational research, which of course Vanderbilt is the number one college of education and has some really amazing educational research um, going on. And it informs, which, which, is, which is a very interesting way of understanding how environment may shape brain development. So let me explain what I mean by that. So you have children before they start school, and then they start school and they start acquiring academic skills. So in a way, it's almost this natural experiment where you're able to, to understand how does education shape and mold and change the brain. This takes a team effort. There is definitely not sort of one person who does this. It takes all sorts of different professions. So on a daily basis, I interact with biomedical engineers, physicists, psychologists, educators, physicians. So you name it. And all those people, by the way, except for, the, except for a physicist, all those people um, with those different areas of expertise are in my lab. So we have two physicians. Um, we have somebody who's in the Department of Radiology. We have many people from special education. We have many people from psychology. So it's really um, a wide range of, of, uh, of people who are involved in this effort. And I find that absolutely exciting and fascinating because every day when I go to work, I learn something from somebody. So we take very fundamentally and in the, in the most basic sense, we take something that's observable, like a child's reading skills, something that you can actually measure. You can see how well somebody's reading a text, right? You can either say, well, how fast are they reading? How well do they understand what they read? Um, and then we combine it with brain, um, uh, measures of brain. Now, most commonly, we are using a methodology of magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. And what you see up here is a um, MRI image, and it would be as though you chopped my brain right here. Um, and, that, and, and so this technology allows us to actually see what's going on in the brain. And there's a lot of different types of MRI, and I'm going to go into what those yield. This is um, a structural MRI, so just showing you the different parts of the brain almost like a static picture, right? So you can have static pictures, and you can have movie videos, right? Um, and you can actually do both in MRI. So MRI technology is, um, is uh, a, is, like I said, is usually the type of modality that we use. There are other types of neuroimaging and obviously other, other types of neuroscience methodology, but to this point, at this point in educational neuroscience, MRI is the predominant um, way that we capture some neuroscience uh, measures. So clearly safety is a critically important issue when you're studying children in development. And fortunately, we can get really exquisite pictures using MRIs. Um, it is a technique that's FDA approved for use in children. It has no harmful x-rays. Um, and because it runs on the properties of magnetism, it can be used in all ages and in almost in all populations with very little risk. Um, how many of you, by the way, have had an MRI done? 
ahead of most of you. So I don't know how you felt, but every time I get into an MRI scanner, because I get in for every single experiment that we do, I try to get in um, and actually do it myself so I understand what I'm asking children to do. And it is so tiny. I find it so claustrophobic, and it always makes me nervous. But the thing is, is that the kids don't get nervous because they're so much smaller, right? So most of the kids, every once in a while some kids get nervous, but most of the time they don't actually get nervous because, of course, it doesn't feel so small to them. Um, so uh, anyway, so this technique has been used to map the brain systems of many, many different types of uh, the brain correlates of many different types of skills that are important for school and for education. And I'm just going to show you a few of them. Um, what you're going to see is you're going to see a lot of brain images. And I'm not asking you to digest every single one, but just to give you an idea of the broad range of research that is out there and how this technology has been used. So we, this is actually a study of ours that we did. This is mapping um, what your brain is doing when you're asked to read. So we're showing here that this is, a, this is the temporal lobe, which is a language area of the brain. And you're showing, we're showing here lots of strong activation, particularly for when you have to understand what you're reading. And when you think of more the phonics part of reading, sounding out those words on the page, not necessarily understanding what they mean, but just being able to sound them out. Um, that's the blue little blobs you see there. So those are the parts of your brain that are being used more when you're asked to just read words and identify them, but not necessarily make meaning out of them. Here is an example of um, a uh, genetic study that, that is actually trying to combine genetics and neuroimaging. And I just wanted to show you this. There's not really a lot of this work being done in, in the realm of education yet. But, um, but it is being done in other populations. This is a study that looked at ex what we call executive function. And all of this area in yellow is what was correlated with their measures of executive function that they were asking individuals to do in the scanner. Now, how many of you have ever heard of that term, executive function? Okay, so some of you. So it's kind of like, um, your ability, it's all your higher level thinking skills, your ability to plan, your ability to organize information. And so it's a really important day-to-day -day thing, particularly in school. So I don't know if any of the parents in here have had the experience of having this totally brilliant child who can't organize their backpacks and keep their desks neat, and you know, if that was the case when they were growing up. But, but we, we see many of those children clinically. And those are children who often have difficulties with executive function, have difficulties planning out long-term assignments, for example, and leave it all to the night before. Not that anybody in this room has ever done that. <laughs> uh, and this is a, uh, a study of correlates of mathematics functioning. And this study up here is examining what is happening to, in those individuals who, for whom Spanish is their native language when they're listening to Spanish versus when they're listening to English. And what you see here is you see that there's activation here when they're listening to um, Spanish. And pretty much the same areas are activated, but there's more activation when they're listening to the English. So that may suggest that there's a more effortful processing going on, which makes absolute sense, right? If you're learning another language, you're probably going to take, it's probably going to take more effort for you to understand. And this is a study that uh, looked at the reward systems in the brain, something that is also very important in education, right? Having some sort of sense of reward for what you're doing, particularly early on. The other thing that MRI can yield is a mapping of white matter systems in the brain, white matter tracks in the brain. And what I'm, I'm going to explain a little bit more what I mean by that. But in the most basic sense, this is a, a technique of MRI that allows you to map these white matter tracks in the brain. And I realize that these are actually confusing because they're not actually in white, even though they're supposed to be white matter tracks. But these different colors are representing different white matter tracks 
in the brain. And I'm going to talk about that more in a little bit. But this is another example of some white matter tracks that are throughout your brain. So all these white matter tracks are connecting very important areas of your brain. For example, this track right here, the superior longitudinal fasciculus, has long been known to be really important in the language and reading area. So back, you know, in back as, as far back as like 1800s, individuals who had strokes, they would find in post-mortem studies that the superior longitudinal fasciculus was damaged and those individuals had trouble with reading, for example. And that's what was sort of correlated, their, their area of deficit that came along with their stroke. And so these systems have long been, these matter, white matter tracks have been long been hypothesized and observed in post-mortem studies, but these newer techniques actually allow you to see it while the person is alive and well, which is great. So let me just think about, help you think about this sort of um, as an analogy of train stations and train tracks. So if you think about this being a train station, and that's, so train station A, train station B, and then you've got train tracks that get you from A to B. Right? Um, and you might be listening to some cool music while you're on the train. <laughs> um, and so these regions of the brain, if you think about one region of the brain um, being really important and needing to work and coordinate with another region of the brain, they have to be connected somehow. And so these train tracks are um, the connection, the wiring. The white matter is essentially the insulation around those train tracks. So it um, changes in efficiency have to do with this is insulation working in a manner that allows for greater efficiency between train tracks. So it's a little bit like you know heating in your house. If you have insulation, it's much more efficient, right? Um, and so this is what these methods here are allowing you to do is understand more about the what's insulating these train tracks and allowing information to travel from here to here. So growth in um, brain and in education are dynamic and interactive processes. We know this from years and years of child development research and from years and years of neuroscience research. And I'm sure actually most of you, since most of you are parents, that you have had the privilege of watching a young child development, develop. Which I have to say that now, I have, that I, now that I have my own children, it's so much more, even more fulfilling and interesting to see all these things that I was an expert on for so many years. Um, so, you know, I'm developing more expertise on the individual level as I go along. Um, but you can appreciate that many changes are happening all at the same time. And this is also the case in the brain. So you have a baby who learns to crawl, eventually learns to recognize letters, write, read. So this is also the dynamics of development that are relevant to school and education that are happening. At the same time, there's um, gray matter development and changes that are happening. Gray matter are those train stations that I was talking about, okay? And there's things that are happening in the white matter too. But just as an example, um, this is showing gray matter um, mature, maturation from five years old all the way up to 20 years old and what is happening in the brain as these individuals mature. Now what's interesting about gray matter and maybe somewhat counterintuitive to some of you who are not as familiar with um, neuroscience is that gray matter is really predominant at birth and gradually yields to relatively greater increase in white matter. So the, 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 the ratios change and, and gray matter actually um, diminishes. So um, decreasing gray matter correlates to increasing white matter. So another way to put this more dynamically, and let me explain to you what these colors mean. I realize I didn't do that. Um, the brighter, hotter colors uh, indicate more gray matter, and the cooler colors indicate less. And one of the video that I'm going to show you is what's happening over time. Okay. 
So the brain is necessary um, to learn, but education also changes the brain, as I said earlier, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. So ways neuroscience reveals more about education. There are lots and lots of, uh, the scope of what I could talk to you about could go on for hours and hours, but you definitely don't want to listen to me for hours and hours. So um, I am going to go over four principles that I think are really of importance to think about as we think about this new field of educational neuroscience. So principle number one, what's on the outside does not always equal what's on the inside. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Number two, what about the wiring? What about those train tracks that I talked about? And number three, the brain can change over very, very short time periods. So there's a lot of plasticity in the brain. And number four, the brain can, pre can predict behavior, or what I'm going to call what's on the outside, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a second, better than behavior itself. So what I mean by on the outside is behavior that, sh that is actually observable. So um, when you see somebody reading, you're able to observe how many words do they read per minute? How many math problems is somebody able to do per minute? What kind of attentional mechanisms were they showing? How fast were they able to react to something? Those are all things that are on the outside and what I'm going to also refer to as behavior. So there's studies that suggest that the brain can actually predict what's on the outside over time in the future, what's going to be future on the outside in the future better than any other thing that is observable. Okay, principle number one. What is happening on the inside is different than what's happening on the outside. So here's an example of a study that we did where we looked at males and females. And we asked the question, do males and females process language or visual spatial information differently, even when appearing the same on the outside? So we had um, 30 adults, 15 males, 15 females, and we had participants press a button either with their right or left hand to answer questions on the screen. And I'm going to show you in the next slide um, the, what we asked them to do. So it'll be your turn to do that. Um, and so pretend you have a button in each hand, your right and left hand. Okay, so the first task we asked them to do was a, what we called a rhyme task. We showed them two words that are not real words. So in this example, BAM and ZOPE. Are those the same? Are those rhyming? Do those rhyme, BAM and ZOPE? No, they don't rhyme. So you push a, push a button with your left hand. So this is what they're doing in the scanner. They're lying down, they're seeing these, these uh, words, and then they're deciding, does it rhyme, does it not rhyme? In this one, FOPE and JOPE. Do those rhyme? Yeah. So you push, they push their right hand button with the right hand button. Now in the visual spatial task, what we asked them to do is we showed them a display where you always saw this protractor-like display down here, and then you saw two different lines in different orientations. And the question was, are the two yellow lines down here in the same orientation as the two yellow lines up here? In this case, no, definitely not. What about in that case? Yep. So that's what we asked them to do, really quite simple tasks. What we found was that they were quite similar on the outside. So for the phonological task, we found that they showed 96% accuracy. So they were able to tell 96% of the time what was what rhymed, what didn't rhyme. Female, a male showed that 96%. Female showed about 97% accuracy. So incredibly close. Males, they also showed. Um, in, in the visual facial task, males showed 94, about 94% accuracy, as did females. So very, very similar performance. So they weren't unequal in terms of their, what, what they were showing on the outside. And the results. Overall patterns of activation were actually similar for males and females. They were using pretty similar parts of their brain. Um, they were using, for the rhyme tasks, they were using a region that's been known to be associated with having to decide whether things rhyme and about right here left in an area called left inferior frontal gyrus. 
for the visual spatial task, they used areas around here um, in, in parietal lobe on both sides. So also areas that we've known for a long, long time have to do with visual spatial functioning. But what we did is we looked at areas that were, we zoomed in on some areas in particular that we knew in previous studies had shown were really the very critical components and parts that were correlated with being able to judge rhymes or do this visual spatial task. So what we found was when we examined these specific regions, we actually did find differences between males and females. So in the rhyme task, what we found was that females tended to use both sides of their brain, whereas males tended to use only their left side of the brain. And so, as you see, these results are small. We're not talking about vast differences between them. But you do see some subtle differences between males and females. And this result has been shown a number of times as well in other studies. For the visual spatial task, it was, uh, it was the opposite in a sense, because males use both sides of their brain, a different part of their brain, but they use both sides, just like the females did with the rhymes. And, and females tended to use just one side. So there were differences in the way, subtle differences in the way they were processing this information. So this is an illustration of how behavior may look the same on the outside, but mechanisms and the way individuals are processing information may look quite different on the inside. And why is this important? Well, this is important because it may um, allow us to predict future behavior. So you may have children that enter kindergarten, for example, and they look like, or first, let's, let's take first grade. You may have children entering first grade, and they're all reading about the same level, right? Or a bunch of children, a bunch of those first graders are. So they all look pretty much the same. But then as the year goes on, you have a whole clump of them that suddenly just um, crash in terms of their reading abilities, and they don't grow the way they're supposed to. And the other ones grow just fine. But they look the same in the beginning. So this type of information, um, brain information, may actually help us understand who, eventually, who is going to um, soar and who is going to struggle. And the reason why that is helpful is because you can capture very early on those children and give them help before they start struggling. And indeed, some, this is what some studies have actually shown. I'm going to show you at the end. So what you see on the outside isn't always what's happening on the inside. So yeah, this is a, this is a little cartoon that my husband actually found. And um, you know, it's, a, it's a no, no, no slam against men or women, but it's just interesting because you, know, you do have that traditional sort of thought that men tend to focus very well on one thing and think about one thing, and then women are often thinking about lots and lots of different things. Um, you know, it's not always the case, but, uh, but I will say that, you know, often I do see that. So, so what about the wiring? So probably all of you in this audience know somebody who had difficulty learning how to read, for example. My guess is, is that you know somebody. Um, and the odds are that you do because about 5% of the population does have difficulty. Come on in. No worries. Um, well, you know, estimates are different. Some say 5. You can, you can hear anywhere from 5 to 17%. 5% is kind of a conservative estimate. But, um, but I can tell you that I've never gone to a party where I haven't had people start talking to me about, oh, I know somebody who has reading difficulties in the reading. Pretty common, common issue. Um, this next study that I'm going to show you has to do with understanding more about the brains and individuals who struggle with reading. So getting back to these uh, mapping of the white matter pathways. So what you're seeing here, again, is white matter pathways that are not illustrated in white. Um, but they are illustrating different white matter pathways in the brain that are important in, in this particular illustration. These are white matter pathways that are all in the proximity 
of an area in what's called the left occipital temporal region. And that red blob that you see underneath there is actually a blob that when you ask individuals to read while they're in a scanner, that area always comes up. It's almost universal that that area is associated with reading. And it's associated with reading skill. So individuals who struggle with reading will show abnormal activation in that particular area. And this, these pathways are all within, white matter path, pathways are all within the proximity of where this brain region is working when you're asking the individual to read. So we took this information in a study that we recently um, completed, actually, and we said, we want to know if you look at this area that we know is really important for reading and always shows up. We want to know in individuals with dyslexia, which is a type of reading difficulty, we want to know if the wiring is different. Are those white matter um, patterns different in individuals who have dyslexia from that little area that we know is important for reading, that always seems to show up when you ask an individual to read? So what I'm showing you here is a representation of where the connections are, those white matter connections, where they were more or less for individuals who were great readers and individuals who, were not, who, who had dyslexia, so were not good readers. And so what you see here is that individuals who are typically developing readers, as denoted by TD here, show greater connectivity from that little region over here, which is about right over here. Um, they show more connectivity to a region called left inferior temporal and left fusiform, which are in the, in, right in the neighborhood of uh, that area where you see, and actually it's that area that you see actually have some, has some overlap with, with those regions. But for simplicity's sake, um, I will say that these are two regions that are known also to be really important for language and for reading. And so people who are good readers show more connections to that area, those areas, than those who are dyslexic. In contrast, those who were dyslexic showed a lot more connectivity to areas further back in the brain that are actually important for visual perception and visual processing. Now you might ask, well that sort of seems like it might make sense, right, because reading is visual. But actually reading is not really that visual. Reading is actually most, has mostly to do with language. And individuals who struggle with reading struggle with language not the visual part of reading. That's sort of like the least of it. There are some studies that show a little bit of a connection, but most of the origins of why people struggle with reading has to do with having issues with language. So the fact that they show more connections back to areas that are really more visual, that are more visual in nature, um, suggests that there's really a very different pattern of wiring that is not going to some of those fundamental areas that's, that are critical for reading. So white matter pathways may hold the key to why some children struggle with learning. So understanding more about these pathways and the development of them during education. And this is just a, I just thought this was kind of a cool picture. Um, this is a, a, a picture of the white matter pathways that um, arise from an area of the brain called the thalamus, which is deep within, um, deep within the brain. And uh, we also just finished kind of an interesting study looking at that in individuals with dyslexia. I'm not going to talk about that today, but the picture is sort of illustrated. Okay, so the third principle was plasticity. And I want to see how I'm doing on time. What, what time is it? Um, plus the third principle that I want to talk about was plasticity, or changes in very short time periods in the brain. So we completed a study where we looked at um, short-term learning. And again, we took some adults, 28 of them, and we assessed their reading, their learning of new words, so we actually exposed them to brand new words that they've never seen before. 
and had them learn them, how to pronounce them, and what they meant. And then we had them um, do some tasks in the MRI machine. So what we had them do was learn new words in two different ways, and I'm going to show you those ways. But just to give you a little preview, one of them, one way was was they learned they learned words was through an isolation method, which I'm going to call phonology and semantics. So it, it drew upon um, those different uh, areas or those different um, constructs. And then the other way that they learned them was through a context method, which I'm going to call centennial. So I'll, tell, I'll show you in a second how we did that. And then, as I said before, we had them do some um, tasks in the MRI. OK, so these are the two different ways that they learned words. So we gave them these fake words, choked. And we asked them to, we showed them a picture of its meaning. So in this, in this particular instance, it's a dog, right? So choked means dog. And then we showed them a rhyming word smote. So the reason why we did this, and we showed them a, a number of different examples of, of the meaning and a word that rhymed with each fake word that we taught them. And the reason why we did that is that we know that having a phonological representation of a word helps you remember it. And we also know that understanding its meaning is important for memory and learning. The other condition we showed them was, again, a fake word, barp, in this instance. The barp plays with her dolls. So that could mean the child, the girl, um, and we gave them several different instances of what these fake words meant so that they were able to glean a meaning from those. So this was a little bit more of an implicit um, way of learning, and this was a little bit more explicit way of learning meanings of words. So what we found overall was that the, um, the words that we taught them looked much more similar to real words after we taught them um, the words. And then we showed them some words that weren't real words. I mean, I'm sorry, that, they had, that weren't real words and that they had never seen before. And what you see here is that the, um, that the words that they had learned looked much more like real words. So suggesting this learning over a very short period of time. What we also found was something else that gets back to um, principle number one. What you see on the outside isn't always the same as what you see on the inside. So we divided these um, individuals into average readers and into excellent readers. And we asked the question, are there any differences between people who are really outstanding readers versus those who are just, you know, passable readers. And does it matter how you train them in these words? And what we found was even though, remember, they looked all, they looked, I didn't say this before, but I'll say it now, that they looked the same on the outside. They learned them all to the same level. They both were highly accurate. They spent a lot of time, you know, acquiring these learned words. By the way, this experiment took about two hours, this whole thing with them learning the words. Um, what we found was that for the excellent readers who were in the lighter blue, that it didn't really matter how they learned these words, whether it was through that, through the sentence method or through the more explicit picture or rhyming word method. They showed the same levels of activation in a particular area known to be associated with reading. But for the average readers, so they're passable and fine, but they're not outstanding readers. It actually really mattered how they were taught. The more explicit condition with the picture and the rhyming word um, yielded a pattern that was much more similar to these excellent readers, whereas that context condition didn't at all. It showed very different patterns of activation. So this actually makes sense in light of the child literature in terms of reading. Because for all children, for about 50% of them, it doesn't matter how you teach them how to read. It absolutely doesn't matter. No, what you, no matter what you would do, they would learn how to read. You know, there's all these debates about you know, phonics and whole language, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. And um, for 50% for of the population, it doesn't matter how you teach them. 
But for 25%, it really, really matters. Those are the lower 25%. And then for the people who are sort of average but not great, the other 25%, it also matters how you teach them. And guess what? It's important that you teach them by very explicit me systematic methods. And that's what helps them get over the hump and become good readers. So this actually makes sense, you know, sort of in the context of, um, of what we know about child development and reading acquisition. But the point that I wanted to make with this was that, again, being the same on the outside doesn't always mean being the same on the inside. So the second example that I want to show you is not um, from work that we've done, but it's a very famous, um, it's a very famous study. And obviously, the, the major goal in education, one of the major goals in education, is learning how to read. You know, that's sort of the job of the first grader. Now it's kind of moved down to a kindergartner. But um, kindergartner, first grade, you must learn how to read, right? That's your job. And, and that's, that's the job at that point in development. Um, and as I said before, some people struggle how to read. Um, minimum is 5%. You do see estimates up to 17%. Here I put 5 to 10 um, and the question is, is that our brain patterns modified if we implement techniques that help children learn how to read? And can you see actual changes if you take those struggling readers and teach them in a very explicit, systematic way? So the answer is yes. And, um, and I'm going to show you this study. And, and it, but at this point, it's over 10 years old. But it's been shown, the same thing has been shown over and over and over again. So I wanted to really show you one of the first ones that showed this. So here is the same old thing that you just saw before that I made you do. Are these two rhyme? Do these two rhyme? That's, this is what they saw. They saw a box, one, one box. Here, I, I put two on here just for simplicity's sake. But they saw one box. And the idea was, does Jeet and Keel rhyme? And here's another example that they might have seen, yote and wote. Do those rhyme? Yes, they do. So the same task that I showed you earlier with the adults. And what you see here is you see this lovely, nice activation in this uh, area. This is the left temporal lobe. And you see this lovely, nice activation in individuals who are good readers. So that's where they're showing activation. And individuals who are impaired readers, I want you to focus on this part right now. In individuals who are impaired readers, you don't see that same activation here in the left temporal lobe. Instead, you see it in the right temporal lobe, which is quite different. So let me go back and just show you again. Here you see this nice blob. Here, nothing. And here, and, and, and it, but you do see something on the other side of the brain. Well, guess what? After 80 hours of intervention, so that's a lot of intervention, but 80 hours of teaching someone really ex explicitly and systematically how to read, um, you see that there is activation here in this left temporal lobe that looks very similar to what you see in those normal readers. So the brain is actually changing as you are changing um, and boosting reading ability. OK, number four, can we predict behavior from brain better than behavior itself? Um, and the answer is, is that there are studies that are beginning to show that the answer is yes. And by the way, in other areas that are not educationally related, there are a lot of studies that show that you can that that mirror imaging measures, MRI measures, have a lot of predictive validity in terms of what, in terms of predicting um, outcomes in individuals. So this is a study, again, not done by our lab, but um, by, uh, by a colleague of mine, um, Fumiko Huff. And it's a really lovely study. And I, I know this is like a really complicated slide. Um, but all I wanted you to take home from this message, or from this slide, is that the ability to predict who is going to grow in reading. So what she did is she took a bunch of readers um, and measured their reading skills at one time point. And then a year later, she measured their reading skills again. 
and some of them were good readers, some of them were poor readers. Um, and in particular, for the poor readers, she divided them in half and asked the question, who, um, which ones grew over time in their reading skills and which one didn't? So much like I talked about with those first graders earlier. You have a pile of first graders, they all look the same, and then some of them grow and do great, and then some of them don't. So she was asking the question, can we predict that better than we can from just those measures that we can observe from the outside? Reading measures, IQ measures, other types of measures. Um, and what she found was that the difference, this is behavioral measures right here in this column, and uh, if you focus on the black dots, that's how well you were able to predict who was gonna grow, about 50% with just the behavioral measures. But if you put fMRI, MRI measures in there, it's, uh, I, th I believe the actual number was 94% um, accuracy you could predict who was gonna grow in their reading skills and who wasn't. So it's just one illustration of some of the, um, the ways that we might be able to be thinking about using these neuroscience methods to help inform education. And then this is a study in our lab um, that I wanted to show you because it's very short-term reading intervention. Um, that reading intervention that I showed you, remember the, the study from 2002 that I showed you that I said lots and lots of studies had shown those changes in the brain after intervention. This is actually a very short intervention that's only 15 hours long with individuals who are struggling readers. And um, what we found is that, that individuals who were responsive, who grew in their reading skills, had a very different pattern of activation in the beginning than those who didn't respond to intervention, even though on the outside they look just the same, same reading levels but their patterns of activation are very, very different. The responders are in red, I mean, I'm sorry, the responders are in green and the non-responders are in red. So very, very different. And um, so again, this type of information may really help us know um, who's gonna respond and who's not gonna respond. Because if you know that you're gonna spend 15 hours working with somebody and they're still gonna be a poor reader, then you're not gonna use that method, right, to begin with. You're gonna say, we need to think about doing something else with this child's time that's more valuable that will help them. So just to kind of sum up, educational neuroscience, where we are and where we are going. The things we know. We know that the brain reveals things that we cannot observe from the outside. The brain can be modified over very short time periods. It can be used to predict future performance. That's a relatively newer type of thing that people are doing, but it's emerging. Where we need to go? We need to have interdisciplinary training. And guess what? Vanderbilt has a new educational neuroscience PhD program, which is wonderful because um, it's the only one in the country. And, um, and honestly, it's probably one of the few institutions that really would be able to do an educational neuroscience PhD to a very high degree because we have such a wonderful school of education and such a wonderful neuroscience program. So we have this um, new interdisciplinary training. Um, there's another area where we need to really start thinking about combining genetic information and neuroscience and education, and those areas are beginning, the studies are beginning. But this, and just overall thinking about it, it's still in its youth, but the possibilities are really extensive. And then finally, just to kind of leave you with this, this thought in terms of educational neuroscience, can we personalize education in the way that we want to personalize medicine? So for those of you who've been around Vanderbilt and got Vanderbilt materials, you probably have heard a lot about personalized medicine. Um, and it's my understanding that Vanderbilt is one of the leaders in that area. Um, but the question is, could you also do that for education? So not so much of a one-size-fits-all, although I realize that people try to, teachers try to differentiate clearly in the classroom. But with more information, we may be able to help differentiate even more and take a lot of those really wonderful teaching techniques that teachers implement and, and apply them to uh, children who have a specific profile, which, they would, which would mean that they would benefit the most from that type of teaching. 
So just to leave you with this thought, remember how I said in the beginning that um, neuroscience, or, or the brain certainly has a lot to do with education, but education also is shaping the brain because it's an, an environment. So there's always this age old question of nature versus nurture. And so one of the things is, yes, we may learn from edu educational neuroscience, you know, the specific goals or understand more about how to improve education, but it also may contribute to our um, sort of some of those age old questions that are bigger that ask about nature versus nurture. So with that, I will close and um, thank you very much for your time. So I think we have time for a few questions if there's anybody who has any questions. You know, it's, so right now that seems like a really crazy idea because MRIs cost like $500 an hour research-wise and then clinically they're a lot more. It's hard to know where the technology is going to go. Um, at the very least, I think that this type of information may help us refine behavioral measures so that we're able to capture children earlier. So we may be able to do enough research studies where we say, okay, the ones who grew versus the ones who didn't, we need to figure out ways to actually measure that better in the beginning with computer, computerized tests or paper pencil tests. But you know, it's hard to know. I mean, if we were able to, to make it uh, more accessible and inexpensive, then you never know. So I will say this, that, that all the studies that have shown what's, um, what's effective in terms of intervening with individuals with dyslexia all show that teaching um, in a more language-based way is um, the way you want to go. Um, because what happens is that, or what, what studies sort of suggest is that individuals with dyslexia tend to rely too much on their visual system. And so what you're doing is you're trying to help them, you know, get their language system a little stronger and more stable. And that does seem to, to help um, improve their reading skills. And I think also looking at where the patterns of activation change after intervention is kind of a clue too, because when they get better with reading, the areas that start being activated are not more visual areas, right? They're more their language areas. So does that answer? So you really have to go after That's what the best research says now. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And that's where I think, you know, I always say to people that I know these pictures of the brain, they look really cool and they look really sophisticated, but if you actually think about psychology, and the long, long tradition of psychology, and you think about some of these MRI methods, they're very much in their youth as to compare to psychological methods. And I think one of the things that's very deceiving is that you have these lovely, pretty pictures that make it seem like it's, you know, over here in its sophistication when there's still a long way to go. So, yes, I think that's definitely a concern. And, uh, you know, so it's, in, it's still in its youth. Youth, it is youthful, youth in its youth, but with a lot of promise. Do you correlate? Um, I mean, I think there are enough, um, well, let me, let me put it this way. So I do think that there are a number of studies 
that um, provide validity for what, how you are trying to measure these things in the scanner. So for example, the kids who improve after intervention, you're having to read in the scanner, and then of course they also improved in their reading skills. So that's sort of a very direct kind of relationship between those two things. The other thing that I want to say is that some of the things that I showed you, the white matter tracks, you're not asking anybody to do anything. And in a lot of ways, I find that type of neuroimaging much more appealing because you're not asking them to do any sort of task that actually sort of hangs, if you think about it, hangs somewhere in between behavior and, neuro, you know, behavior and neuroscience, right? Because you're still eliciting a task that's sort of more psychologically based. So the structural studies are just, you know, they're what's there. And I think the fact that those really do show distinctions between individuals and they're replicated over um, other studies uh, provide, provide validity. So I'd say that I think we have um, confidence that we're, that we've got, that we're onto something that is um, helpful and certainly worth the investment and the time but I don't think that we have, by any stretch of the imagination, all the answers yet, and it's still a misuse. So I just think that's an important point. Actually, I should have said that, you know, when, during my talk, because I usually say that. Uh-huh. Yep. So there's certainly ongoing um, research in that area, and um, you know I think where neuroscience has evolved is that I, I think there was used to be a much more sort of rigid thought about those critical periods. It's not that they're not there, so there are certainly more optimal times, but I think the brain has much more plasticity than we originally thought. But that doesn't mean that there aren't time periods that are critical. So for example, kids, um, she, this probably was in her book, um, that, that kids, b babies when they're born can hear all the phonemes, all the different sounds um, that are in any language in the, in the world. But that window gradually closes and they can't distinguish between those different sounds that are not in their language. And could you maybe go back and train somebody to hear those sounds? Yeah, you probably could through lots of different um, methods, but it's not, you know, just just there as as easily. So it wouldn't be as easy to learn the, the distinguishing of sounds. Does that make sense? Yeah. which is why we spend a lot of time in the United States teaching people languages when they're older. <laughs> I don't know, that's changing, but it is sort of funny, isn't it? Um, so, uh, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up. Um, I actually just went to a, a conference called Dyslexia and Talent where people were talking about this very idea. And um, there's certainly a lot of anecdotal evidence that individuals with dyslexia have this totally different way of thinking that's really, you know, they may have difficulties in this area, but they have incredible strengths in other areas. It's a really hard thing to study in any sort of scientific, precise way. So it, it's anecdotal at this point, um, but there certainly are instances of, of that. Charles Schwab, um, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of CEOs that seem to have just like, like yeah. So, um, you know, whether there's, whether there's something really concrete that we're able to capture from that, if we were able to, 
Um, and, if, and if it was something that was really sort of, an, if there was other areas that were advantageous, uh, that would be a wonderful thing to be able to capture because a lot of the skills that you know people think may be more enhanced in dyslexia are certainly skills that you would love to be able to capture because they could be so helpful to be able to teach to other people who don't have dyslexia. <laughs> It's hard to know. It's hard to know. I mean, there is a, there are a couple of studies going on now where people are sort of trying to hone in on whether there is a dyslexic a dyslexic advantage. You know, but again, it's a, it's kind of a hard thing to systematically scientifically study. So we, um, we do screen out individuals who have, uh, for example, like major psychiatric disorders or on um, uh, medications other than stimulant medications. Um, dyslexia and ADHD and reading difficulties and ADHD tend to travel together. They're highly heritable. Um, and so we don't try to um, exclude people on the basis of taking something like Ritalin. But anything else besides that? Um, individuals are excluded, and we ask about sort of early birth history and trauma. So, so if there's something like a traumatic brain injury in their past, then we wouldn't include them because we want to know the specificity of dyslexia. And then um, some of the kids receive are in special education, and um, some of them are not. And I will tell you though that the parents are all concerned about their kids' reading, and many of them have gotten tutoring for their. In, for their children. So we don't use the special education definition necessarily because um, there are a lot of kids who are, who are missed. So I, I, I'm going to I'm going to preface this, yeah 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 I'm going to preface this by saying that I am um, not a person who's studied uh, you know cross linguistics but uh, at all so there I have colleagues who are much much more experts in this area but it is sort of an ongoing debate you know for example in the field of reading is it that there's a universal signature that's associated neural signature that's associated with reading ability or is there something a little bit different. Um, the most recent, um, the most recent evidence is sort of suggesting that there's pretty much a universal, but there's some differences. For example, in Chinese, there's some other differences. Right. Right. And there are actually some studies that are going on right now with young kids and looking at them longitudinally who are bilingual and is there. Is there, are there differences? And yeah, and, and, and how the environment is shaped for you to learn that, you know, whether you're actually living in a different country and hearing that language all the time or learning it through school. So I think we probably have time for, for one more question. So there, um, I, I have not done any um, studies, but um, there are uh, individuals who are interested in, in, in those types of questions, definitely. So, and they're and they're obvious, you know. There's, some, I mean, that's a great question because they they really seem like they could go together. So. All right. I think we're